So here's Field of Dreams when the sun and the moon and the stars all line up, bam, there it is, uh, rows and rows of tomatoes. And then you're like, holy cow, it's gonna be 105 tomorrow. I'm gonna be picking 500 boxes and I got none of them sold. So um, what I've ended up doing, I did farmer's market right up to about two years ago and then um, my body got too tired. I got, uh, it's, it's a hard way to make money, especially with all the competition in this area and everything. So I actually started focusing on seeds and plants and it's been the best decision I've done so far. I'm actually also working on a book or whatever, so that'll be my next thing too. So I wanna sell my 20 years in the tomato trenches. So I do the Florida weave, a steak, three plants, a steak. These plants are planted about 18 inches apart in five foot rows. You can do five or six. You wanna get the most out of your property, five foot between these rows. You got a little bit extra space. It's nice to have six feet so you're not crawling through the tunnel. The reason when you're doing the weave, you wanna have them, I've done them two feet apart, the plants, but the tomatoes start to get on them. They start to sag between the strings. You can tie a string here or there and prop it up, but if you want a more hassle-free, I plant them about every 18 inches. Um, like I said, these rows are five feet apart and every 18 inches long, those are probably 100 foot rows. This is actually, if you look at all the tomatoes and the fruit, they have little trichromes, things that they put out to protect the plant and stuff. And when you crawl on your hands and knees for 12 hours picking tomatoes, that's what your fingers look like. Perkley tie-dye, the green one was cool, was a neat breakthrough, multicolored tomato. Like I said, I focus a lot on stripes. Here's the interior, um, not a real red one, but it's interesting, I didn't know until a customer pointed out the different colors inside actually have different flavors. It has, uh, the red is kind of sweeter, the mellow is kind of yellow, and the green actually has almost a sharp flavor to it. So it's a uh, blended wine in the skin. Pink Berkeley tie-dye, uh, that's my number one selling seed and plant for quite a few years. It's resilient, it's tasty. I knew years ago when I put it head to head with Cherokee Purple in a taste test and 10 out of 10 people said they like Pink Berkeley tie-dye better. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Nothing against Cherokee Purple, it's still an awesome one. It's probably the number one heirloom in, the, in America, that's just why I referenced it. And this is actually, as far as I know, a cross between Cherokee Purple and Green Zebra is actually how this became. Again, we've now gotten into beef steaks with the anthocyanin and varieties, which is nice. The wild one was a runt, and it was hard to get past the runt size, but now after seven, eight generations and thousands of plants, now we have everything from cherry, or cherry tomatoes to beef steaks. Interesting thing with anthocyanin is they need extra time to ripen. And so you can see this green you see, that's the flesh of the tomato. You're seeing right through the skin to the flesh. So you're wanting to see the color on it. The sun shines here is what activates. It's a UV activated thing. So back here is where the sun didn't shine. So when you're growing the, the anthocyanin tomatoes, check the bottom, check the back, make sure they're fully ripe. And if doubt, most of the time you can leave them on the vine for a whole extra week and they become excellent. There's definitely a line there between having the ripeness. So as far as I know, anthocyanin expression in the tomatoes, it's a chemical the plant releases to prote protect itself against certain stresses. It just happens to be this great looking antioxidant. Um, every time I see when it's, the plants are going through extra stress or whatever, you can see the plants will purple out. Um, wherever the sun or UV hits a tomato, it's producing that to actually protect the plant a little bit. Dark Galaxy, really cool. Um, spots, stripes, anthocyanin, meaty flavor, texture, great production. Blue Beauty, another awesome one, can even be grown in cool climates. Lucid Gem, as good as any bicolor I've ever eaten, has amazing with the cool black top, most heat tolerant variety I know of. Also probably a two week shelf life on the average after you pick it. It's amazing, I think that's also part of the anthocyanin um, where it's protecting the fruit, well it's also protecting it from breaking down. And I've had mixed boxes of tomatoes that I've sold with you know, occasional anthocyanin and regular varieties and one get lost in my garage and I open it up and it's like, whoa, fuzzy wuzzies. And then I'm like, whoa, what are these perfect anthocyanin varieties mixed in between? So I think they have antifungal properties too. I've also had them stem poked. That's, you stem poke a regular heirloom, it's melted or moldy the next day. I've had them stem poked sit on my uh, counter for a week and no, didn't even start to sink in that area and stuff. So it's, uh, it's really cool. A lot of times when you're going with uh, something genetically you want, you get what they call genetic drag. So you wanted this cool, 
cool coloring or whatever, this, this black, oh, well, it's completely riddled with disease. It only produces two tomatoes. It's this, that, whatever. It was none of that, actually. It has, I've found better disease resistance. I've found it kind of gave it a hybrid vigor because you're going back to the old wild species and crossing it with the newer species. I've seen weird truss flower formations in a good way where they're like, God, it sent out some there, it sent out some over there. So most of the genetics that went along with this were actually more positive. The biggest hurdle to get over at first, the first two, three generations was finding something with really good flavor. Brad's Atomic Grape, that one's pleasing a lot of people. It's got great flavor and everything. Just FYI, Jared Gettle's favorite tomato in the world. Um, <laughs> A lot of people, it's just really amazing. It uh, has amazing hang time. You let it get, you get them all the way um, ripe, but they great flavor, super crazy, unique um, patterns and everything. It's been a really good good one. Berry's Crazy Cherry, is a, that's a variety I can't say enough about. Um, great flavor. It would probably grow in the track cracks of the tile right here. Um, if it was 110 tomorrow, you'd be picking edible tomatoes. If it rained tomorrow, you'd be picking edible tomatoes. Um, crazy production. Again, it can hang ripe on the vine sometimes for two weeks or so without deteriorating. I, that cluster there, some of those tomatoes were ripe two or three weeks before I picked that. That's the way I let the cluster get all the way. And you can actually take and shake it and just let the tomatoes fall in your hand. So anybody that hates picking cherry tomatoes, this is a good one. You put your hand under it, shake it, and you got a handful of fruit. So here's actually Napa Rosé, and this is, a, I think, a really good one, really great tomato. And this was interesting. It was uh, an anthocyanin cross, so I was looking for red and yellow and pink cherry tomatoes with anthocyanin. This pink one came out with no anthocyanin, but the flavor was so good. It could hang on the vine. Um, the shelf life was great, so again, Mother Nature threw, well, you're looking for this, but hey, how about this one? So here's where I crossed pink prickly tie-dye and uh, indigo apple. So this was finally to the F2, the exciting part. And I grew 100 plants that one year, and I ended up keeping, I think, 30 of them, which usually on my average, if I grew 100 plants, I'd probably keep two. I, you know, I, the bar's gotten raised pretty high in the last several years. So I was, it was... Actually, it spawned, ended up spawning quite a few varieties that I have and that I'm making. So I just took the two of the best, coolest tomatoes I could, crossed them, and so this was how they're all different evaluated. And actually, there's F2 Black Beauty right there. I'd never, ever, I'd grown thousands of anthocyanin varieties. I'd never seen one that was almost all black, and that's all the, just in the F2. Here's their raised beds. They live in Napa. Probably 12th or 15th year they've grown tomatoes here. Can't grow tomatoes in the same place. You can and you can't. First one, you gotta be diligent. First, second, you gotta have healthy soil. Third, you gotta get lucky. So they have raised beds. Their general way of doing it is, uh, this is probably September or whatever, about October, uh, they take the plants out. They add about a two to four inch layer of some really good compost. Dig it in. They actually um, plant lettuce, carrots, beets, a few things like that. That's one of the reasons they have these little if it gets down in the 20s, they'll cover them. If it's in the 30s or more at the winter time, they don't worry about it. So then they plant a few winter vegetables. They pull those out in general in April, another two to four layer of inch of compost. All of these things have been added is water. So once you have a nice billions and billions of microbes working for you and you're replenishing them with food and reintroducing the army twice or more a year, now you're eating off living soil and you're having fun watering, picking, and pruning. And instead of you looking at your neighbor going, why is this plant so good? She's got all the neighbors going, what's going on over there? So um, testament to organic. I started off when I first started with my friend, I copied him. I went and I planted a bunch of tomato plants, watered it threw a handful of triple 16 down at the bottom of each plant. Plants always crapped out really quick. That's all these organic farms started popping up. And I actually went around visiting different farms and stuff. I'm like, dude, the organic guys' plants are bomb, man. You know, they're still green, they're still healthy. What, how many times do you spray these? You haven't sprayed. And really it was a testament to healthy plants will usually take care of a, you know, a lot more problems, pests, disease, everything than, uh, than not. Um, cruddy dirt with a total chemical regime will not grow as good of a, a crop more times than not with good soil, good seed, and uh, nothing else.